Here's a question that asks if PSP, which stands for Progressive Supranuclear Palsy, is PSP in the Parkinson's family of neurological diseases? How is it similar and how is it different from Parkinson's? There are several diseases that we collectively call the atypical Parkinsonian disorders. Sometimes it's called Parkinson's plus syndromes. And it's a collection of diseases, four, five, six of them, that have big long names. They usually have abbreviations like PSP or MSA. But collectively, these diseases um, share some similar symptoms as Parkinson's disease. So we say that people have Parkinsonism if they have symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Um, so these atypical Parkinsonian disorders, including PSP, they share some symptoms of Parkinson's. In the case of PSP, um, people have um, slowness of movement. They have a lot of balance problems. And the way that it's different from Parkinson's is that um, unlike, I mean, like the other atypical Parkinsonian disorders, uh, PSP tends to progress a little faster than Parkinson's disease. It does not respond as well to medications. And in particular, PSP, people have way more balance problems right from the beginning of the disease compared to regular Parkinson's. Um, Follow-up questions are, is the cause known? Not really. Um, is it known if it's genetic? Um, I think like Parkinson's, it's, it's complicated. We don't know of direct genetic cause in the vast majority of people who have that particular disease. All right, this question says, please explain how the Exelon patch would help my memory. Um, there's several parts to this question. Um, the Exelon patch is rivastigmine, which is a medication that acts on the acetylcholine system. That's a brain chemical that's involved in memory. Um, typically, uh, patients who take these medications for memory um, don't necessarily experience a great improvement in memory per se, but the medications are designed to help slow down the loss of memory. Um, uh, and so, so that's the mecha mecha mechanism by which it works. Um, it says, um, will I eventually have difficulty swallowing um, with Parkinson's disease? Uh, the swallowing muscles and the speech muscles do tend to be affected in Parkinson's disease, usually uh, later on in the course of the disease. Um, uh, and so eventually, yes, swallowing does become a difficulty uh, for uh, most people with Parkinson's disease. Um, and that is typically treated, again, not with medications, more, more with speech therapy, uh, which can be very helpful in preventing any kind of um, major swallowing problems. But eventually, yes, it will be affected. So. Real, real brief interruption. Um, a pair of glasses has been found. If you're missing it, um, see me down here at the front. Okay. Uh, the question is, why isn't Parkinson's disease included as a disease on the CDC website? Because it's a neurodegenerative disease, not communicable or infectious, and um, it is the second most common of the neurodegenerative diseases, but the CDC actually follows a different line of uh, disease processes, mostly infectious, communicable, and that line. So this one I've got is, what research, if any, is being done with marijuana use to control Parkinson's? And there is. Uh, when you think about marijuana, uh, it's a plant, and why is it psychoactive? Well, there are receptors, there are proteins that respond to marijuana in the brain. And they're actually, the brain produces its own marijuana-like molecules, they're called anandamides. Um, there's, a, there's an awful lot of research going on into the mechanisms, but before you get to the clinic. so. Animal studies have suggested that there are some drugs that, inter that modulate the
the endocannabinoid, the marijuana-like processes in brain that may be effective. But we don't have any conclusive data whatsoever in humans. So this is a, a very much uh, a topic of considerable interest, but there's a long way to go. So I just got a question. Um, do you have a brain bank? Um, and w we don't. There is no national brain bank. Um, louder or too loud? Oh, you. Do. so I, I was about to ask all the panelists if they knew about one. So um, who's from Pennington here who could answer the brain bank question? So through the dementia's, dementia center here. It's important, just basic education about brain banks, um, it's important that they be local because once someone um, passes away, um, they say harvesting the brain, which is seems a little morbid to me, but harvesting the brain within a few hours is extremely important. And so um, it is very important that you find a local resource to be able to do that. Um, but I will say brain donation um, and brain banks um, are a very promising um, avenue and resource for researchers to tap into um, and um, one that is, uh, you know, limited, right? We don't have a ton of brains affected by Parkinson's disease to be able to study in. So um, I think, you know, that's a great way to volunteer for research. Just a couple of quick hitters. Um, is as elect generic? No, it is not. Is there any known connection between seizures and Parkinson's disease? Not really, but I mean, there are certain encephalitic type Parkinsonian processes that can develop, but those are very specific and it's not a, it's a quick onset in association with an encephalitis which could or could not have seizures. So it, it's not a real good connection to generalized epilepsy. And um, if there is a specific question that someone fell when they were 30 and they, they broke their sacrum and, and that there's no really good connection there on the data that we have in Parkinson's. So, you know, there's talk about a chronic inflammatory response, but I don't think it relates specifically to something like that. I have a question here. Is it possible to balance Parkinson's signs and symptoms with hallucinations? Um, and individuals who do have hallucinations, that's certainly our goal is to reduce or eliminate the hallucinations. Um, but I think uh, the challenging part, and this question alludes to that, is that some or most of the drugs that can treat hallucinations block dopamine. That's how they block the hallucinations. And as you probably learned today, blocking dopamine is, is bad for Parkinson's. So basically, the drugs that treat hallucinations can worsen Parkinson's and vice versa. The drugs that treat Parkinson's can cause hallucinations. So it is a challenge at times to balance these two issues. but. Um, there's a couple of drugs that Dr. Whidden mentioned that we use Seroquel more often than uh, Clozaril, but Seroquel is pretty good at treating the hallucinations without exacerbating or worsening uh, Parkinson's symptoms. Um, and so it's, it can be very challenging, uh, especially in people with a disease called Lewy body dementia, but um, that's, that's what we try to do. I'd augment the thing that Dr. Whitten mentioned, and there's a new drug, Pimvanserin, which looks like it's probably going to get FDA approved in 15. Uh, and its data looks really promising. Uh, the question is, are there criteria for a good candidate for the gel surgery, referring to the levodopa gel that's infused via the pump? Um, so. Yes, uh, at least uh, at the time, uh, at this time, I think the best candidates are going to be people who have advanced Parkinson's, who've been on levodopa, oral levodopa, and have motor fluctuations. They have the wearing off um, and the dyskinesias. Um, those are the, the patients that are going to need this type of uh, procedure. Also, I would add that um, um, there are... Uh, 
when, it, when Parkinson's gets to the stage where there is motor fluctuations and dyskinesias, um, uh, the currently available treatment aside from medications is a deep brain stimulator. So again, there are certain people who cannot have or do not want to have brain surgery, and this again may be something uh, that would be good for that particular niche of patients. Um, um, and it remains to be seen if this will ever be used uh, in patients with earlier Parkinson's disease, uh, but that's certainly uh, uh, something that's being thought about. Um, and then um, this person asks, is being overweight, or, 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 I'm sorry, overweight a problem to being a candidate for the gel surgery? Um, not technically that I'm aware of, although it, being overweight does make any surgical procedure a little bit more risky, but, uh, but not specifically, no. And then I have a related question. Um, uh, it says, if the patient already has a feeding tube, can the duodopa system be used, essentially? Um, and I don't know that I could definitively answer that, but, uh, but basically the, the tube has to be in a very particular place. It goes um, through the stomach and into a part of the intestine called the duodenum, so I don't know uh, the certain answer to that question, but uh, I would imagine that it would have to be a... Uh, uh, I, the, the tube that it's in has to be one that's compatible with the, the delivery system that the company makes. So. so we have a question about clarifying, uh, better describing the REM sleep uh, disorder that we mentioned and how it may be a precursor or indicator of Parkinson's disease. So REM sleep behavior disorder is um, a sleep disorder that is defined by the fact that it occurs in REM sleep. There are very stage, various stages of sleep, light sleep, deeper sleep. REM sleep is rapid eye movement sleep. We also know that it's our dream state. And normally a person does not move. They don't have muscle activity ability during the dream state. And REM sleep behavior disorder actually is defined by the fact that there can be muscle activity and even dream content enactment. It's uh, very pathological. Um, it can cause injury to self and bed partners. And it has a very high incidence of preceding Parkinsonism. Um, actually, there are studies that call idiopathic REM sleep behavior disorder, meaning something that you can't explain by maybe a medicine that's causing it, they actually define it as an alpha-synucleinopathy. And there are neuroanatomical pathological studies that would uh, support that. If you pair REM sleep behavior disorder with other biomarkers like loss of olfactory function, um, considerable loss, uh, you may, th these are very profound predictors of uh, developing Parkinson's disease. I've got a question here. What's the connection between Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease? And it's a uh, loaded question. There's a lot of connections. In Parkinson's and Parkinsonism, there are two conditions. There's Parkinson's disease with dementia, PDD. Okay, there's two conditions. There's Parkinson's disease with dementia, and there's Lewy body dementia, or Lewy body disease. Uh, Parkinson's disease with dementia is usually defined as you have the motor symptoms and after the motor symptoms have appeared, you develop dementia, which is similar to the Alzheimer's dementia, not identical. Lewy body disease, the dementia usually precedes the frank appearance of the motor symptoms. In both, you have dementia, so you have problems with recall in memory, uh, and unfortunately, the treatments are really not well developed. Aricept, for example, is used as it's used in, in uh, Alzheimer's disease, but these drugs that are used work for a relatively short period of time, 12 months, 18 months, and then lose effectiveness. So they are temporary holds. There's a lot of work going on, though, because as Dr. Sheese mentioned, Synuclein can be trafficked between cells. One cell can release it, and it can get picked up in the next cell. So it's like a toxic 
progression, toxic highway. The same thing happens in Alzheimer's with phosphotau, a different molecule. So a lot of people are looking at both to see what are the shared mechanisms. So someone asked me a question, said so often trials are too far away, do you pay for travel expenses? Um, this is a great, great question and what I mentioned um, sort of the Fox Foundation approach to trying to attack this issue for the field to do away with it so we never have to worry about clinical trial recruitment again. Um, this is one of the key levers um, is helping, you know, matching people to trials but then also helping them actually get there. And so um, my answer to this is two-pronged. So um, number one, any Fox-funded study, we absolutely insist that there is money in the budget for what we call subject travel and accommodation um, to support that. That may mean parking in the parking garage, and that may mean getting on a plane to come there for the visit. Um, and we work really closely um, with the sites involved in the studies that we fund to make sure that they're doing that and to emphasize how important that is because um, it's a stupid reason for people not to be able to participate in trials, in my humble opinion. Um, the other thing that I encourage you all to do is when you find a trial that is further away and you do need support to go there, ask the site if they're able to support you in that. Um, one of my fears is that we give all this money to sites to support this and then they never offer it to people. Um, some sites are really good about it and others not as good. So if you find a trial that you're interested in and otherwise would be all systems to go, um, I really encourage you to pursue that with the site. Um, usually sites in my experience will find a way to make it work. Um, and like I said, I think it's a horrible reason for people not to end up in a trial. Um, and you know, we're pushing as hard as we can with what we have control over um, to make sure that that isn't the case. Um, there is another, it's, it's, a, it's a small resource, so it's not going to be okay to inundate them for everyone to take advantage of this, but there's a group um, called PALS, P-A-L-S. Um, it stands for Patient Airlift Services. Um, and it's the nonprofit arm of a group of private pilots. And when they are flying back from dropping someone off, um, if it is convenient for them, they will bring someone specifically to participate in a trial. Um, so that would be something to look into. Um, they didn't want us to put it on our website because they were like, we can't afford to be inundated by you. But whenever I'm in places that don't have as much access to trials, um, I always make sure to share that. So um, that's another thing potentially to look into. I have a few questions here. One is, is there any research or drugs on improving handwriting? Well, I don't think that I know of that there's any specific trials on that. I think we all need that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I would certainly need something. But um, nothing specific. Many of the Parkinson's drugs that are already out there actually helps with the small handwriting that is typical for a Parkinsonian process. Are there any correlations with strokes and Parkinson's disease? Strokes in the right location, subcortical strokes that, that hit certain areas can certainly cause a Parkinsonian process. Um, and one kind of for all the clinicians, how would you know if Cinemet is working if you've never been off of it? And that, that's a complex question, and it depends on the, the dosing and, and the stage of, not stage, but how, where you are in, in Parkinson's disease, and it also varies from practitioner to practitioner. So any thoughts from the panel on that particular question? If you have Parkinson's disease, it almost certainly is working, uh, depending on the dose you're on. I mean, it may not be enough, but... Um, I think what they might be getting at, if, you, if you're not responding to levodopa, then you, then you might not have regular Parkinson's disease. You might have one of the other Parkinson's-like diseases. But um, almost by definition, if you have Parkinson's disease, you, you should respond to, to levodopa if you can take enough and, and not have side effects from it. But even in a more in somewhat practical sense, we talk about when we do studies, we actually want to know that, how well you respond. Um, and actually before uh, you get, if you're a candidate for deep brain stimulation, 
we want to know how well you respond to levodopa therapy. So we talk about a person coming off their medicine for a period of time. Conventionally, it's about 8 to 12 hours where you don't take the levodopa com component of your medical regimen. And we call that the off medicine state. That gives us a pretty good um, understanding of... Uh, and then we, we put you through testing, and then we allow you to take it, and we get a good picture of your uh, response to uh, levodopa. Uh, okay. I'll take one. Uh, what are the end stages of Parkinson's disease? This is not a topic that's covered often, and it's one that's obviously really important. Uh, people, there are problems with swallowing, problems with eating, and sometimes those necessitate placing the stomach tube. There are clearly issues related to respiration. People develop pneumonia, falls, and the trauma and bed, being bedridden because people break a hip is, is very uh, devastating in Parkinson's. I think there's, there's work going on. A lot of it is common medical practice. But I think one of the things that it emphasizes and people often don't pay attention to is that you should plan ahead. You should plan for financial considerations. You should plan for who's going to care if you become impaired. What are the directives for your care? All of those kinds of things can be anticipated and really done well years, if not decades, before uh, one goes to end stage. The final thing I'd like to say is that with end stage Parkinson's, there have been data now, studies before 1974, which was considered the introduction of levodopa into widespread use, and studies after 1974. Studies before 1974, patients with Parkinson's disease died earlier than those who did not have the disease. They didn't live as long. After 74, there is a difference. It's about six months. So the lifespan is essentially the same. So you've got a long lifespan. You've got excellent care and the ability to manage. But there's also the responsibility to take care and be proactive in managing your uh, life. Start over. Okay. I'll take one. Uh, in early Parkinson's disease with minimal symptoms, can anything be done except let Parkinson's progress until the day when drugs are helpful? Well, um, as we talked about a lot, and this was the focus of our conference last year, and, uh, and again, those, those lectures are available online through the Pennington website, and there's links through the neuromedicalcenter.com website. But I personally think exercise is um, one way to improve your symptoms. And um, there's evidence to suggest that people who, who exercise more um, certainly do better in the long run. Uh, so there may be some kind of protective effect there. Um, however it works, people, people do better, so um, that's one thing you, you definitely can do. And then, of course, we're hoping for neuroprotective drugs or disease-modifying drugs. We don't have a definite one yet, but um, I think exercise would be the best way before you might need a symptomatic treatment. Uh, this is a question about, are cytokines overproduced when there's a mental stress or depression? Excellent question. Um, could antidepressants administered early help to delay onset of Parkinson's disease? And if yes, then access to mental health should be easier. I agree with all of that. <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of work in looking at stress and, and depression and the effect on the brain, and I'd have to say that, yes, the cytokines are released in chronic stress. It's harder for me to say that with depression because it's, it's a symptom that 
is, uh, I can't just isolate and say that it's the cause. I don't know if anybody else at the table can. Maybe you can comment on it. Um, but we do know that, uh, you know, chronic stress affects the whole body. It might not be a direct effect, but definitely there is a, a pathology that's set up, uh, affects systemically, and that maybe not the pure immune system, but other systems in the brain that cause release of uh, things that would eventually cause release of cytokines, like uh, uh, mediators of stress and the norepinephrine system, et cetera, um, would be involved. Um, the, you've posed a research question insofar as saying if you uh, treat with an antidepressant, can you delay the onset? Um, again, that's a wonderful statement. It's a clinical question that should be answered with uh, uh, a research study. Um, I can't answer it right now. Um, something we should look at. Any, any comments? Um, okay. Okay, I'll, I'll ask a, answer a related question. The rate of suicide among Parkinson's disease patients versus the general population. And I'm going to answer it a little bit tangentially. Depression is common in Parkinson's disease. The odds ratios, the how many fold increase over the general population ranges between 2.8 and 4.3 depending upon what studies one looks at. So depression is common in Parkinson's disease. It has been suggested to precede the motor symptoms in many cases. Because depression is relatively common in Parkinson's, there can be an increased suicidal attempt, but the overall rate doesn't go up dramatically. May, that may be, in other words, completions don't go up dramatically. One of the things I'd like to say in this regard is that Depression in Parkinson's disease can be treated. There are some differences, so the available literature right now suggests that as a broad group, the SSRIs, the, which are, what are the preferred group of drugs to treat depression in the general population, are not quite as effective as the tricyclic antidepressants. But for all of these studies, the first drug that's used doesn't work in a large percentage of patients, and you're often going to a second and a third drug before you stumble on the magical one that really works. But you, if you persistent, and these trials take eight to 12 weeks, so you can't just say in two weeks or a week that it's gonna work. If you're persistent, you can indeed treat depression, and because it's so debilitating, I urge you to work with your clinician to do that. There's a second part to this, the question, which was, what is the effect of alcohol on treatment meds? Um, and uh, that could be answered in many ways. Um, moderation is always good. Uh, it's actually the only one I can think of at this moment is the fact that REM sleep behavior disorder tends to be treated with a long-acting benzodiazepine called clonazepam. The anxiety that is very profound in Parkinson's disease, or can be, can actually escalate to a, uh, even a panic attack state. Um, and those are the two symptoms that I can think of where the treatment, uh, benzodiazepines, are not a good mix with um, alcohol. I, I think that the carbidopa levodopa combinations are safe. Um, and do uh, you have any other thoughts about? I, I've got one on the known toxins that cause Parkinson's, the known toxins that cause Parkinson's disease. The best well known and characterized is a compound called MPTP. It was developed in the San Francisco Bay Area um, as bathtub chemists trying to synthesize an Demerol-like drug for abuse. Uh, their bathtub chemistry wasn't very good, they didn't control the temperatures, and they ended up getting a contaminant, which was subsequently identified as MPTP. 
when injected into people or into non-human primates, it causes a fairly profound Parkinsonian-like syndrome. And it's, that has been exploited in terms of basic research in mice, in non-human primates, because it provides a really excellent model of Parkinson's. There has been, on the other hand, more recent, there are epidemiological data long-term that have shown that pesticide and herbicide use is associated with an increased risk of development of Parkinson's. On the other hand, administration of pesticides and herbicides to non-human animals for research purposes, you don't see a very rapid development. There, has been, there have been some studies where you see development of Parkinsonian-like signs and symptoms, but the pathology underlying is somewhat different. Uh, and I think that right now it's an area of hot and continued interest. There's uh, another question. Um, diagnosed with Parkinson's disease for seven years. Until recently, my doctor just increased dosages and schedule of medications, and I led a relatively normal life. Um, I, at what point do I have to accept that I have Parkinson's disease and slow down? Well, actually, never. Um, you shouldn't slow down. Uh, there's a lot of literature that suggests that physical activity, I'm not going to say exercise, I could, but physical activity, being physically active um, and mentally active is by far the very best therapy across the board, okay? Um, and there are a lot of, there's a lot of studies that support that. Uh, I will take it a notch higher and tell you that if you're physically active but you want to employ exercise, then I would encourage people to do exercise that comes naturally to them, what they like to do and always escalate it so that it becomes more and more um, demanding on you, challenging, because that's always good for the brain. It's kind of a positive feedback system. What do I mean by that? Well, they talk about people that like to walk. Well, that's fine. You know, lengthen the mileage. Walk with company so that you can walk and talk at the same time. Seriously, um, if you escalate the degree of activity that you're in, that you do, and add layers of uh, socializing and other things, it becomes a very powerful therapy in and of itself. I have a question. Why do I have so much trouble getting enough sleep at night? Do medications to treat Parkinson's affect sleep? That's a, that's a very uh, complicated question, good question. A lot of people well, everybody with Parkinson's um, has have sleep problems. Um, first of all, as we get older, uh, in general, even people without Parkinson's have more and more problems sleeping. Our, our sleep architecture breaks down a little bit as we get older, so it's a natural phenomenon of aging. But when you throw in Parkinson's, uh, people can have REM sleep behavior disorder. Um, not related to Parkinson's, they can have uh, sleep apnea. Um, that's just common in the population. Um, people can have uh, restless leg syndrome. That's common with Parkinson's. They can have periodic limb movements of sleep. Um, and certainly the medications to treat Parkinson's can affect sleep. Um, the dopamine, all the drugs that stimulate dopamine can, en can enhance dreaming, cause vivid dreams, and that can disrupt sleep. Um, can cause daytime hallucinations, and, and that can disrupt sleep. So there's, there's a lot of... There's a lot of things going on with, with sleep, and that's definitely something to bring up with your doctor because it, it, it may take a sleep study. It may take changing the medicines around. It may take um, changing your behavior. There's certain activities you can do to improve your sleep. Um, we call them good sleep hygiene habits. So that means that you maybe cut down your caffeine. You don't exercise late at night. You don't eat in bed. You don't stay up in bed watching TV late because that trains your brain to that you know that the beds for kind of relaxing and entertainment and not for not for sleep and really uh, bed should just be for for sleep and sex literally um, we do tell people that um, so I hope that answers the question it's complicated any other thoughts on that Uh, 
there's a question here about um, a levodopa, in, a levodopa inhaler. Um, I'm not aware of an inhaled form of levodopa. There is an oral pill form. There's the new intestinal gel, and uh, one of the pills is dissolvable under the tongue, but I'm not aware of any inhaled form. I think the, the issue with levodopa is you have to have a certain protein that carries it into the body. So, for example, it's not in the stomach, it's only in the small intestine, and it's not in the lungs either. So I don't think the inhaler is on the horizon. There is a rescue inhaler that's being tested right now. It's in the very early stages. I don't know that it's a levodopa. Yeah, I think it's a rescue therapy, but there is an inhaler, but it's more if you're completely frozen um, and later stage. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's Epica. Here's one. Um, th does anybody here today have DBS and are you glad you had it? So if, if you're willing to raise your hand and say, make that statement, somebody's asking that question. Um, I see several hands going up. Thank you. You're right here in the middle, so I'm just going to come to you. So, hopefully, it's a good one. I've had the DBS for two years. Uh, Dr. Calligan was is is my uh, neurologist. Uh, Dr. Wagespach was my neurosurgeon. Uh, I had extremely good uh, results from it. Uh, at the time I was I went in, I was taking on every four hours. A Stilevo 75, uh, Cinemet 2500, and uh, uh, it was either one and a half or two milligrams of uh, Mirapax. I was taking it every four hours, up to six times a day. Since I wasn't sleeping, I might as well take the pills. Uh, <laughs> uh, I take now uh, 0.75 milligrams of Mirapax about three times a day. Uh, when I f remember today, I forgot my medication, so I'm completely off medication right now. Uh, I was on the left side, the side that I'm uh, holding the microphone with is uh, my active side. Uh, I have uh, completed a, a graduate course at the University of Dubuque Seminary. I work out every day, or try to. I haven't been able to the last few days. Uh, but uh, I, I would endorse it completely. Uh, the only thing is, uh, it is very, very necessary for you to get the uh, neuropsychologist to allow you to uh, to do it because the, uh, uh, as I told my father about it, he said there was no way that he could sit through that uh, because he was too much of a type one personality. Uh, he's too used to being in control and when when you're under in the uh, operating room and completely uh, uh, completely awake but completely at their mercy uh, <laughs> you have to you have to have complete trust and you have to be able to uh, let go of control but other than that uh, I haven't seen any drawbacks in this at all thank you for sharing I have a question here. Is there any connection between giant cell arteritis and Parkinson's disease? And there were some early studies looking at that many years ago, but the, it's an inflammatory process and we just had this good lecture by Dr. She's talking about an inflammatory role in it. So as with any of these processes that are out there, it's it's more complicated than just yes or no. So there there may be a, a a link to the inflammatory process that set it up to begin with, but to answer, say if you have giant cell arteritis, there's a 50% chance you're getting Parkinson's disease or something like that. You can't do that. So there was a question: Are there any studies being done on hyperbaric treatments? Um, not that I'm aware of, but I'm going to make another plug for Fox Trial Finder while I can. Um, there are all kinds of studies on that site. There's an acupuncture study. There's a meditation study. There are lots of different exercise and dance studies, as well as a lot of 
different um, treatment trials, um, some for people with early disease, some for people with more progressed disease and specific symptoms. Um, so I really do encourage you all to go and at least take a look and see um, what you might match to. Um, and I think it'll give you a really good sense of sort of the broad swath of opportunities out there. Um, so. Here's one that says, does Parkinson's have an effect on the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system and smooth and cardiac muscle? So somebody knows their anatomy. Um, yes, Parkinson's has an effect on all of that. We talked about how Parkinson's affects the autonomic nervous system, and that includes the sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, nervous systems. Um, that's why people have trouble with blood pressure control in different positions. That's why people have trouble with um, constipation and um, temperature, regula uh, temperature regulation, uh, sexual dysfunction, all of that is controlled at least partially by those, those two um, parts of the nervous system. And regarding smooth and cardiac muscle, uh, indirectly, yes, because uh, again, there's, some, there's a lot of parasympathetic control of smooth muscle in the gut. We've, we know that there's Lewy bodies there. In fact, we may diagnose Parkinson's by uh, getting um, small intestinal biopsies one day. That's been, it's been looked at. Uh, it's see Lewy bodies there very early on and the um, small intestine of a lot of patients with Parkinson's. So uh, it, it, it does affect all of that. Regarding cardiac muscle, there's some, there's some sympathetic uh, innervation to the cardiac uh, system. Uh, I don't know if it affects the muscle directly. It's more about the, more about the rhythm and things like that. But um, that's, to my knowledge, how it affects it. Any, any other comments? Have we about exhausted our questions then? Okay. Um, well, they were terrific questions. Um, I think they were also incredibly useful answers. Um, so just some, some wrap-up uh, comments. Uh, first, we value your feedback. So each in your packages, each of you have a, a feedback form. We we've really have modified the conference in, in response to the feedback we've received in the past. So please, if you will, take the time to do that. Um, second is that uh, you can see that there, uh, while it's frustrating in terms of uh, progress this disease, there's definitely progress. We have to comment on what is really an incredible special situation that we have in this country. That is, you have incredible minds that are dedicated to looking at this disease. You have a research organization, a research network that, a, that helps in that inquiry. We have research funding that comes from government, and comes from foundations, comes from individuals, um, and it's just incredible. And we have addressed diseases in the past quite successfully. Uh, this is more complicated, but we're marching ahead, and without this enterprise, there would be no chance. There would be no chance to address this issue. So, so we have that all in place. That's an incredible uh, advancement of, of um, of our human experience, and it's uh, very, very special in this country. And you see that we have it in this state, as represented by the um, by the Pennington Center and the Neuromedical Center. So we're very, very fortunate. We have many people to thank uh, the, the many volunteers who were here, um, background people in terms of the organization. Of this meeting, our, our AV crew. Um, again, we had our exhibitors; um, and they were quite useful in, in providing you information. I want to thank our sponsors. Uh, and then just this incredible panel of speakers we had uh, really enriched um, the experience. I'd like to give them another round of applause. <clears throat> and again, we're, we're not here to hear ourselves talk. Um, and we're here to communicate with you uh, about progress in this, um, in this uh, medical condition and to get feedback from you. So it's been very, very successful in that regard. We really appreciate your support, uh, signing up in advance so that we know uh, how many people are, are going to be here and we can, we can plan for that. So I want to give you a big round of applause too.